Bearwalker by Joseph Bruchak Chapter 25 Rescuers Mr. Osgood and I hear the pontoon chopper go overhead just before we reach the bottom of the trail. We've made pretty good time with him leaning both on his stick and my one good shoulder. The fact that he found a second power bar in his pocket for me to wolf down helps him too. Defeating monsters does work up an appetite. And before we even reach Camp Chuckamuck, we are joined by three sheriff's deputies who have driven their pickup to the place where the road was blocked by the dynamite blast and then walked the rest of the way in. Whatever I said in my cell phone call must have been convincing. It has brought as much help as any of us might have wished, more than we even needed. Stay back, one of the deputies is saying to us. A figure is starting toward us down the front of the main cab camp building. Shucks, young fella, Mr. Osgood says. I'm not that afraid of my wife. The deputy steps aside as Mrs. Osgood throws her arms around her husband and me both and squeezes hard. With our combined injuries, it probably hurts him as much as it hurts me, but neither of us complains. Thank you, Mrs. Osgood whispers to me. After being greeted by Mrs. Osgood that way, I'm only a little surprised at what I find when we follow the deputies into the building. Everyone is there and unharmed, aside from Mr. MacCall and Marlin, who appear to have suffered a considerable amount of bruising and are tied up in the corner. My midnight escape had provided the opportunity for Mr. Wilbur and Mrs. Osgood to put a couple of good-sized bumps on the heads of the distracted and dim brothers when Mr. Mac ran out after me. Mr. Wilbur had used a chair on Cal, but Mrs. Osgood had found a handier weapon. The fact that Poboy was engaged in taking a bite out of Marlin's leg had made it a bit easier for her to take aim. Dent in my bear pan, Mrs. Osgood complains. When Mr. Mack came back in, he found himself confronted by the sight of two incapacitated confederates, a large growling Labrador, and the pearl-handled pistol, in the hands of Mr. Philo. I've got a shotgun, he said. Filled with rock salt, Sonny, had been Mrs. Osgood's rejoinder for, from her hiding place behind the door, before she'd used the ca her cast-iron bear pan to punctuate that remark. We looked for you for a good hour by the lake, Mr. Wilbur says, then explains how they decided, over his protests, to concentrate on keeping the other kids quiet and protected. After all, Jason Jones was still out there, and the safest thing for everyone to do was to stay inside, where the adults could keep all the doors and windows guarded. Once we heard the helicopter, Mr. Wilbur says, gesturing toward the rescue craft, floating on its pontoons just beyond the dock where I fell into the water. We knew you'd gotten through. He pauses and looks at me. Have you gotten taller? He says. Then he laughs. Baron, you have been through the mill. Talk about a rite of passage. He reaches out a friendly hand and squeezes my shoulder. It's the same shoulder where the bear bit me. The colors around me are fading to gray. I start to sink toward the floor. I can hear voices shouting from far away. Then everything is dark and silent.